Okay, well, good evening, everyone. My name is Caleb Saucer. I'm the Director of Campus Ministry International, and we are excited about this webinar that's happening tonight to talk about campus ministry in a post-COVID world. We are going to give it just a second to allow some people to join on. What I would say is while we're, we're waiting here for just a moment, why don't you take some time and comment in the chat. Let us know what campus you're representing. And, uh, and even let us know how many years you've been involved in campus ministry. So a little chat feature that should be over if you're watching on your, uh, on your laptop, should be over to that right hand, right hand side. If you're on your phone, couldn't tell you where it is, I'm sorry, but maybe you can find it and, uh, and throw that comment in there, where, where you are watching from, what campus you represent, and then also how many, how many years you've been involved in campus ministry. Do a couple housekeeping things just before we get started here this evening the first is that throughout the course of this discussion for those who are watching on their laptops we will have a couple poll questions that come up and uh we want to kind of hear from you use this as an opportunity for you to engage uh with us to get a little feedback on on what's happening in your world get a little feedback on who you are so that we know even better who we're talking to for instance sample poll question i'll put it up right now you should see it if you're watching on your screen uh, this question, how many years have you been, been involved in CMI? We'll keep it up here for just a second. Why don't you take a second, respond to that poll. Uh, you can click the submit button there at the bottom. The answers are less than one year, one to two years, three to four years, or four or more years. We'll give that another 10 seconds or so. Watch it. 70% have voted. We go 66. And we'll close it in five four three two one that poll is now closed we can share the results and see so it looks like so far from those who are already logged on 11 percent have been involved in campus ministry less than a year 41 percent one to two years 11 percent three or three to four years and then 37 percent for more years so we kind of all over the map tonight which is great meaning we have a lot of people with varying varying uh, degrees of experience in campus ministry and uh, and so we welcome you here tonight. The other kind of housekeeping thing I'd say is we will utilize the chat feature tonight. If you have a question that you would like for us to answer, we'll reserve a little bit of time at the end for some Q&A. So feel free to throw that question in the chat feature and we'll do the best that we can to get in to those questions at the end of this call tonight. I have good friends who uh, some of the best friendships that you'll make are through campus ministry. And I'm also excited because I just get to play the role of moderator tonight. I get to kind of lead the discussion, manage the discussion, moderate the discussion, and let these incredible ministers kind of just speak into our lives tonight. First, you can see many of you would be familiar with Brother Mike McGurk. He is our national director of training for our CMI team. He's also Maryland's district coordinator and a longtime, uh, long-term campus ministry he, or campus minister. He's one of the very few around the continent who are full-time in campus ministry and we're grateful for the work that he does and contributes to campus ministry uh, also joined by jason cole who is our florida district coordinator and has been doing an absolutely incredible job driving the cmi ship there in one of our great districts and then also matthew wilson who's a longtime campus minister at the university of louisville he and his team have been incredibly effective and god has used them to do some incredible results on that campus. These three guys are going to impart into us tonight, and I'm excited to hear what they have to say. So without further ado, we uh, want to go ahead and get this conversation started. Our goal tonight is to talk about what does campus ministry look like in a post-COVID world. There's no doubt COVID has thrown all of us for a loop. It hit right in the middle of last semester. Many of us were scrambling to try and figure out what campus ministry looked like. We heard from many campus ministers, is it still possible to have campus ministry? Are we shutting the thing down? What are we supposed to do? And, uh, and so tonight we're here to talk about that right here on the verge of the fall semester. Now is the time to be making some serious plans for what CMI looks like going forward. And so Mike, I wanna start with you. Uh, obviously COVID has changed much of the way that we do church, changed the way that we do life. It's changed our jobs. What are, um, what are some ways that you think that COVID has impacted campus ministry, both for the good and maybe also for the bad, some challenges that we have to overcome? Sure. Well, thanks for having me on, Caleb. Um, first off, I'll say that it, I'll start with the bad, we'll end with the good. 
the bad is obviously we don't have the same abilities to reach people like we once did. Our evangelism is having to be changed. Uh, we cannot just walk up to somebody in the classroom and invite them to the campus ministry or try to ask them for a Bible study. Now we can't even see any students. So that obviously makes things a little bit more difficult. Our meetings have been shut down. We can no longer be together. Um, and I think in some ways it has caused a, uh, a anxiety and maybe a fear or frustration upon a many campus ministers. And they feel frustrated because they don't know what to do at this point. Um, but the good is this is actually an open door and this is an opportunity. And you're going to hear some great stuff from Jason and Matt. But I'll just share with you guys more of the, uh, the spiritual side of how I feel like God is trying to position us in this and the good behind it. And the good is God is trying to push us out of our comfort zone. He's trying to push us to a place that we've never been. Uh, Brother Victor Jackson preached at Awakening and talked about how great things are not done in a corner. They're just talked about in a corner. And so God actually physically did that to us by pushing us out of the corner and into the public uh, scene or through social media and other ways where we have to be more strategic and very prayerful. And what I feel like God started dealing with me about is he reminded me of the book of Acts in chapter one and into chapter two where God or Jesus was speaking to the apostles and he said, I'm going to pour out my spirit, but I want you to go tarry in Jerusalem. And where I feel like we're at right now uh, in this moment is God is trying to position us. Uh, we talk all about the outpouring and we talk about how God's going to do these great things on the campuses, but we forget that there was a 10 day season where the 500 made the journey to the upper room and they had to be there for a season to pray. Uh, God literally shut everything down. He told them to stop working. He told them to stop doing what they were doing and pushed them into an upper room where they were going to seek him and pray until something happened. So I believe that in this moment right now in our campuses that we started out with 500 when, we, when they saw Jesus go up to heaven, we started with 500 and then they trickled down to 120. And I think in this season, we have to be very prayerful and understand and not lose our burden that God has put us here for a season to pray until something happens. And it's not just to get us to pray, but it's for us to catch a spirit of prayer. And so God's trying to release a spirit of prayer upon campus ministers so that we can see an outpouring. Every single major thing that happened in the book of Acts, prayer always preceded it. Prayer was always uh, the fire starter. It was always the ignition to just about every major miracle in the book of Acts. And so I think in this season, what God's trying to do is he's trying to release a spirit of prayer by stripping everything away, pushing us into an upper room. The problem is, unfortunately, some people walked away from the upper room right before the outpouring happened. And so I guess I would say that God's positioning us and we need to make sure that we're yielding and finding that spirit of prayer so we can be part of that outpouring uh, when it happens. But it's just for a season. It doesn't mean we don't still reach for people and don't do all these great things we're going to talk about. But we got to remember strategically he's trying to release upon us a spirit of prayer like he did in the book of Acts. Man, I absolutely loved that, talking about the preparation that goes into revival. And if COVID has done anything, in many ways, it has caused us to pull back from the busyness of life, especially those first couple of months. It right. felt a little uncomfortable where we were used to go, 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 do, do, yeah. do. And all of a sudden, it's no, you can't go anywhere. No, you kind of locked away. But it's in those seasons of preparation where God can set us up for something incredible whenever the door opens up again. Also, I love the fact that in every crisis, there are opportunities that are presented in that crisis that you might not otherwise have had. And while COVID caught us off guard, we do know that the fall semester we're about to go in is really the second semester that we've dealt with COVID as it relates to campus ministry. Many of you, I saw the reports on campus or on uh, social media, seeing how you guys adjusted and utilized technology to continue the mission and continue acting on that burden of seeing souls saved through CMI. And, uh, and Jason and Matt, I know both of you have seen some incredible testimonies of what happened even during that weird season of trying to do campus ministry in the middle of COVID. Jason, why don't you just share with us some, some testimonies from what happened in Florida at the latter part of last semester, uh, even during this COVID, COVID environment? Jason, it might just be me. Can can you guys hear him? Jason, I think your your audio may have may have gone out. While Jason's working on getting that fixed, Matt, let me jump up to you. I know the other day when we were talking through some of this, you shared some some testimonies of what had happened at the end of last semester. 
why don't you share a, a few of those? Build a little faith that all hope is not lost, even though the scenery may have changed. Yes, sir. Well, at the University of Louisville, um, I feel like God positioned us to be able to teach more individual Bible studies. So between between March and May, we may have taught about 75 to 100 individual Bible studies, which allow us to know that people are still hungry for the word of God. Through that, we saw three people filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. And we had one person baptized in the name of Jesus during that time. Um, so it didn't stop, it didn't cease. God still was moving. Um, we had a couple of people that had to go back home, obviously. They had to get off of the campus and their parents were involved in the Bible studies. Um, their siblings began to be involved in the Bible studies. Um, their neighbors, um, we saw co-workers join Bible studies. It was just amazing what God was able to do just because, like you said earlier, God pushed us out of our comfort zones. So we had to find a new way to utilize what we had and God allowed us to do that. And through that, we saw, you know, there are many healings. Um, like I said earlier, three filled with the Holy Ghost, one baptized in Jesus name. Um, so God's amazing. Now, Matt, before we miss the incredible nature of this, now correct me if I'm wrong, when you say you taught 75 to 100 individual Bible studies, this wasn't sitting face to face in Starbucks at this point, right? No, sir. No, so, sir. It uh, was... Go ahead. How was your, what was your methodology for teaching these Bible studies? Yes, sir. So um, something that we were already doing were like FaceTime Bible studies. Um, we had implemented that earlier in the year. Um, so that really propelled us and pushed us to do the more, you know. So FaceTime Bible studies, Zoom Bible studies. Uh, we didn't meet up, we couldn't leave the, uh, the house. Um, there are several that you just had to do for, um, phone call Bible studies. Um, so things like that, really using our phone and our um, media to connect with the students. I love that. And again, correct me if I'm wrong, but when you say three got the Holy Ghost, that was not standing in the altar at church. That was not mm -hmm. even being on campus in the room where you normally do your Bible study. That was over mm -hmm. FaceTime, correct? Correct. Nor was it laying hands. Nor was it laying hands. It was through an unusual medium of teaching Bible yes, studies through a screen, like what we're doing right now. And but seeing seeing results, seeing three people receive the Holy Ghost, uh, not even being in the same room with them physically, socially distant. But man, even through that environment, God was able to move, and we were able to actually see results. It was more than just theory and talking about it. You saw God do some incredible things. I love it. But Jason, I want to try to kick it back to you. We're going to test test this audio again. Talk to me and see if the audio is working. Man, I'm I'm not sure what's going on. I we're still not catching you. I wonder if maybe you can call in with your phone and maybe try the audio that way. But in the meantime, we're going to go on. I hope that we can get that fixed because I know Brother Jason has quite a few incredible things to share tonight. So with any luck. He'll be able to, to figure out that audio. While we're waiting on that, though, I do want to do another poll for those of you who are watching. And uh, you'll see it pop up on your screen. Take a second and respond to this. I want you to describe your school's current situation. So first answer, we are fully open. We're holding classes like usual. If this is you, then congratulations. I imagine you are one of the few. The second answer, it's a hybrid model. We're split between in-person and online. Third answer, we're completely online. And then the last answer, we're still waiting to find out. Maybe your campus hasn't, hasn't quite made a decision yet to see which direction they're going to go. We'll give this a couple more seconds before we close the poll and reveal the results. Got 82% who have voted. We'll give it another five, four, three, two, one. Close the poll, share these results. So 2% are fully open and holding classes like usual. I can tell you those 2%, uh, wow. you just made the rest of the people on this call incredibly jealous because obviously uh, the majority, it does not look normal. We've got the hybrid model at 72% split between in-person and online. That's positive because at least it means there's still gonna be some interaction with people on campus. You're not completely digital. For 13%, you're completely online. And then another 13%, who are still waiting to find out. This is kind of what I expected. 
uh, that we'd be a little bit all over the map, but what we would understand through these results that no matter who you are, except for that random 2% or that lucky fortunate 2% who maybe everything looks like it's moving forward as normal, you're having to deviate a little bit. You're not able to, to do things like you normally would. Even when we think about, let's say that the campus is open completely, we're able to hold our services, our Bible studies with social distancing and mass restrictions and all this other stuff it's going to look different. Campus ministry is going to look different. Matt, I want to kick it back to you because I know that your team has already been strategizing about what this looks like, what your strategy is going to be for campus ministry for this next semester. Why don't you take just a second to kind of walk us through some of the things you guys have already been doing leading up to the upcoming semester, but then what some of your strategic plans are going into this semester uh, battling COVID. Okay, I had muted myself, I'm sorry. Um, something that we're working on currently is how to be on campus and still impactful. So what we decided was that our main meetings would be hosted at our local assembly or our church. Um, but the other days, what we would do was, would be dorm Bible studies and individual Bible studies. So something that our church is doing um, is small groups and um, our bishop and pastor uh, my pastor and the bishop, Bishop Nichols, they've been instilling that within us. You have to go smaller to go larger. So with that small groups, dorm Bible studies, it allows you to teach maybe two to three people at a time. Um, but it's people that you would have not usually been able to teach. So that's something that we're really going to focus on. We're doing that four days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And then the Friday is our meeting day. We'll do that at the church. So. That's how we are moving forward. We're doing our prayers, um, our team prayers. We call it core prayer. We're doing that right now via FaceTime. That's a good way to stay connected. People are able to pray at home. Um, those that live in dorms, they're able to pray in their dorm rooms, um, but it's still very powerful and the anointing has been flowing a lot through those prayers. So those are some of the things that we've started doing and implementing. Um, understanding that there are restrictions um, due to COVID, um, I don't know if we'll be restricted in meeting in person or organizations on campus, but I do think that it will be good to start practicing and doing these Bible studies um, and meeting um, in different locations in those cases, in that case that we are uh, pushed off campus. I think that's great. So if I'm kind of reading into this, would it be safe to assume you're moving which I know you guys did this anyway, kind of just as your regular strategy, but you're focusing heavily on the one-on-one -on -one individual Bible studies. And right now, whenever you do have a service, you're actually taking it off campus to do it in the church, simply because we know the restrictions will be a little bit different. We're not certain what the camp campus is going to allow us to do right now. But really, the emphasis is we're, we're trying to focus on those one-on-one -on -one discipleship opportunities, and whether that's in person or that is utilizing technology, Kind of shifting that focus away from this event driven mentality and more towards everybody reach one and let's see let's see this thing grow organically another thing you mentioned is prayer which I, absolutely incredible that since march you guys have been praying 6 a.m every single morning for your campus for your campus ministry i know this is something mike felt to talk about tonight as well mike can you want to jump in here and kind of fill in some of some of these these gaps where you kind of were thinking about prayer and how this relates to uh, are approaching campus ministry right now? Sure. And like I said earlier, I really think this is going to be a critical piece to everything we do this semester. And it's always critical. But God's kind of put us in a place where we really need to make it the priority, even though it is the priority. Sometimes it's easy to get caught up in busyness and, um, you know, even just event planning and different things like that. So I would say, as Matthew said, it's amazing they're doing it over the phone. Uh, we've had some CMIers meeting up at the church. It's been very powerful. Actually, today, it happened to be pretty amazing. There were three different groups from three different districts that just happened to be in the area and they all got together to pray and it was very powerful. So I think that one thing we really need to consider, and I know there's some districts where you're very spread out and I totally understand that, but making prayer the priority where you're not just praying by yourself. If, you, if that's all you can do, then that's awesome and that's good, but try to get together. There's power in numbers. And even if it's just meeting up at the church, I mean, I've said it a billion times how important it is to pray on the campus, but if you can't get on the campus, praying from the church is great too. 
And the other thing I'll say, and this is something that I uh, was talking to a friend about that I think is important, and that is that you got to remember the campus is going to be a little bit different and it's going to be weaker. The spirit world of that campus is going to be weaker. So right now we have a unique opportunity to really put a dent in our campus by doing some prayer walks and some other things uh, while there's some uh, should I say less resistance on the campus because there's less students and less activity. So think about it like this. Maybe God is giving us an opportunity to really push some things in the spirit uh, while there's not as many, uh, there's not as much sinful activities going on. There's not as much uh, normal activities on the campus. So right now we actually kind of have a vacuum, an opportunity, an open door to hit the campus hard in prayer when there's less activity and, and push it back. So by the spring, we'll have even more liberty than we ha would have had if we would have been fighting our normal day-to-day -day or weekly or semesterly um, battles. But now there's more of an open door to push it back because the enemy's a little bit weaker than normal with less activity on the campus. So be thinking about uh, having some strategic prayer walks. You can do it in your mask if you got to, um, but you can still do that. And I think it's going to weaken uh, the spirit there and it's going to push some things open even some more. Mike, talk talk a little bit because let's say there's somebody who can't really get on their campus for whatever reason. Maybe the campus is locked down. We can't get on the campus. Maybe that doesn't really apply to many. But I remember in and Jason may actually can speak to this as well. I remember in Florida, Sarah Mock did something unique with a campus map and basically did a call it a virtual prayer walk or a it was walking in the spirit. Definitely explain kind of what what that process was. And how if for some reason somebody's limited can't get on campus that they could still pray over their campus in a strategic way. So um, can y'all hear me now? Oh right. yeah, sorry. Hey, we we got so, you now, brother Jason. Glad you're here. I'll mention okay. something real quick, um, Jason go because I know that he probably had more. I'll just give you a really quick story. It's really interesting. I'll let Jason go. So one time I happened to be looking at campuses and seeing which were the largest ones. I, I just was interested in seeing the numbers and I came across UCF. And it was really, it was really interesting. I was Googling it and I just so happened to come across their campus map. And I've never done this before. It's going to sound crazy, but I literally took my finger and I pointed on the computer and literally just went like this around the campus and was praying for it. And there was a strong flow and God was doing something. And I happened to talk to a friend who goes there and it was, it confirmed some things. So uh, there is definitely something that can happen in the spirit by just pulling up the map and praying. And uh, it was a cool experience, but I know Jason, they, they did that as a district as well. Yeah, um, you guys can hear me now, right? Yes, sir. Got you. Okay. Yeah, we did um, We did a virtual prayer walk. Uh, the first year that we did our CMI training event, Sarah Mock, what she did was for every campus that was represented, she was able to get a, a, a printout of their campus and she got them blown up and we had everybody in their campus come together and pray over their specific campus and it was very powerful. Is very powerful. It was. It was. People were able to actually strategically pray over a specific area of the campus that they may not have been able to get to. They're able to pray over the freshman dorms. Some people were able to pray over the uh, the athletic center. You know, it, it was a very unique uh, opportunity, and um, and we did it again when we did our CMI training event this pa uh, last year. We did it again also because we found out that the students really uh, responded well to that and they enjoyed it very very much. So I would, yeah, I would encourage you if you're able to do, if you can't get on campus, yeah, find a way to print out your campus map and do a virtual prayer walk. That we can lay your hands on the map and, and just and send angels and say, God, we're just praying for your will to be done on this campus in these specific areas. And, you know, I, I believe that God will do great things. And we did see God do some great things uh, in Florida. One testimony we had was in Cent University of Central Florida. Uh, they told me there was a young lady um, who had been uh, praying to receive the Holy Ghost. And one night in her dorm room, she was reading in her Bible. And she prayed and she got the Holy Ghost in her dorm room. No one was with her. No one was, uh, you know, praying with her. She got it all on her own in her dorm room. And so those are things that, you know, where God can move in spite of us, in spite of this COVID week pandemic. We can't get on campus, but God can still move. And I do believe that prayer is the key to seeing things like that continue to happen. Hey, that's awesome. Brother Cole, I'm glad we figured out your uh, your technology difficulties and you're able to, to join us tonight. I do want to rewind because I remember there was a testimony that you shared that was during COVID and maybe it was the one you just shared. So if so, we, we'll move on. But you, you shared something the other night when we were talking, a testimony of something that had happened there in Florida at the end of last semester, even during this pandemic. 
Do you mind sharing that testimony, building a little faith? Again, that all hope is not lost despite the current situations. Uh, well, one of them was about the young lady who uh, got the got the Holy Ghost in her dorm room, um, and we have another testimony that we're we're working with a young lady uh, who's who's coming to our church from Georgia. She's going to Jacksonville University, uh, a university that's uh, located close to downtown Jacksonville, and she's part of the ROTC program. And uh, so we've been working with her a little bit, and she invited some people from her ROTC program to church. And uh, we were having kind of like some revival services. And it was the neat thing was they were twins. And so uh, they were born seven minutes. They were born 11 minutes apart, but they both got the Holy Ghost in this revival seven minutes apart. Um, and so we have an opportunity to potentially launch a brand new campus ministry at a brand new university in Florida uh, in the fall, Lord willing, uh, with some ROTC students. Uh, so, uh, don't limit your, your, uh, I'm trying to think of the word to say, don't limit your, um, just looking and say, well, God can't reach this, this, this group of people. God only can focus on this group of people, man. You know, let God be God. You just never know who's hungry. You just never know who is, uh, uh, who wants what we have. And so I was, don't limit yourself. Don't limit God either in the process. So awesome, awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. Now. We are going to transition a little bit because I know right now we've talked a lot about prayer. We've talked about preparation, but I know that there are some of you who are on the call that that really what you're looking for is what can we do? So if we're in a hybrid model and we saw, I think over 70 percent of you are in this hybrid model. There's 13 percent of you who are fully online. Um, obviously, this changes the game when we're not able to walk the campus halls. We're not able to do outreach like we've always done outreach. And, uh, and so it begs the question. How do how can we still be effective in campus ministry despite these conditions? What the obvious answer that's going to come out, we're going to talk about some ways to leverage this, but it's to use technology. And we've seen now more than ever, we've seen the church step up to the plate and utilize this medium that in many ways, absolutely, it can be used for evil. But what we've seen during COVID is we have taken this medium of technology, whether it's social media, um, whether it's Zoom, whether it's Google Hangouts, whatever it may be and are leveraging it to spread the gospel all around the world. I, I've told a few people during this, some of my heroes during this pandemic have been these pastors who never set out to be televangelists. They never set out to have their messages broadcast to the world via social media. Yet we've seen these men and women of God step up to the plate, jump out of their comfort zones and say, no matter what is going on, we're still going to have revival. We're still going to have church. We're still going to sow seed and see what God can do. I wanna put up a another poll here. And uh, you can see here, really what, this is a pick all, all that apply here. I'm curious, what technology have you leveraged during this COVID experience, if any of it? Um, and maybe it doesn't apply to all of you, but I have to imagine when it comes to Facebook, Instagram, comes to Zoom, Google Hangouts, and unfortunately it only let us do five options or else I could have gone down the list and probably list, listed a half a dozen others. But just curious, those of you who were trying to do campus ministry during COVID, what is some of this technology that you may have leveraged at the end of last semester to do this? We'll give this just a second more showing 70% have voted, 75%, uh, 80%. We'll give it another five, four, three, two, and one, share these results. 71% said that they have leveraged Instagram. Uh, that's been a neat thing. All these campus ministries that I follow or even through the CMI account, I'm able to see, I get a notification every time one of you guys go live. And so it's pretty, it's pretty neat whenever it's just saying this campus ministry is going live, going live, going live. During the semester, it was like it was happening pretty often because people were putting content on IG Live and IGTV pretty regularly. Utilize Facebook, 88% utilize Zoom. That's absolutely awesome. We're gonna talk a little bit about Zoom tonight uh, during the re remainder of this call. Google Hangouts, another 18%, another 22%, so they leverage some other technology. Mm -hmm. Obviously, technology is an incredible resource that we have, and in many ways, we've been forced to kind of rise to the occasion, utilize technology in our local churches. And yes, it's also gonna to apply to campus ministry. For the call, I want to kick it back to you real quick, and I want to consider this, this campus scenario where we're in the hybrid model or we're completely online, where we're not able to do strategic evangelism like we typically would. We're not able to interact with people like we typically would. Our meetings are moving offline, or moving online, sorry, and our 
are digital through technology. What are some ways that we can get students into our CMI chapter if we are either in the hybrid model or we're in this all digital setting where we're not able to do evangelism exactly like we we have before? What are some ways that we can leverage technology and use it to create this digital environment for CMI? Well, uh, Brother Saucer, one way that we can do that is to make a Facebook page. Um, if you don't have a Facebook page for your campus ministry, I would strongly suggest that you do one. Um, there are options on there that you can do where you can boost post. Um, I've tried that with our um, hyphen group here uh, that my wife and I are privileged to serve, at, serve with. Um, I've done that. And really, um, it, it helps get your name out. Um, people are on social media all the time, you know, with iPhones, Android phones, people always have the phone in their hand, they're checking Facebook, ch checking Instagram. Uh, definitely do do something like that uh, to get your name out there, Up to, upload it daily with content, um, you know, put devotionals on there, something that will something that will get people to check out your page. And you can put events on there, say, hey, we're having this event or say something like, you know, um, are you struggling with uh, anxiety or, or, or something like that? We're going to, you know, we're going to we're going to be talking about that. Come come find out more uh, with this event in this room, this time, such and such uh, things like that. Or, you know, we're going to do a Zoom call, uh, DM us or direct messages for uh, information. And you'd be surprised the number of people that would reach out to you. Um, we, we've done it a little bit here and we've, we've seen some, some good results with that. Uh, but I would strongly encourage you. That is one way that you can do that. Facebook and Instagram. I would definitely utilize those to the best of your ability, um, with reaching students uh, on campus and letting them know of that you're on campus and some of the things that you're doing. Um, and another way that you can also, uh, be involved with that. Of course, we talked about zoom calls. Uh, Facebook also has the Facebook rooms that you can utilize to uh, get together and meet with people. Um, I, I've tried that too, and it works pretty well. Uh, with Zoom, the only thing with Zoom is there's a time limit with the Zoom call, unless you pay to have it longer than that. Um, uh, usually most Zoom calls go for about 30 to 40 minutes, uh, but you can have it to 100 people in that room. Um, but if you want to do anything more than that, I know you have to pay. I don't know what it is off the top of my head, uh, but um, that is another option that you can use as well. But for us, uh, to get back to the Sasha's question, most of the success that we've had is just using Facebook, using Instagram, and, and letting students know, hey, we're on campus, boosting posts. Uh, with the boost post, you can uh, pick uh, the age demographic that you want, and it will blast that post. It'll pull, it'll pull up in their feed like a sponsored ad in their Facebook feed or even on Instagram, and they'll see it, and they can click on it, and it'll have your information about your campus ministry there. So I hope that answers the question. I hope it didn't go off topic, but I hope it answers the question. No, that's all good. You you hit on a couple things there with the Facebook groups and Zoom and some of the limitations that are um, that come with those territories. I would say on social media too, continue putting out that live content. Go live for a daily devotional. Have a different leader in your campus ministry. Put stuff out and engage with students on a daily basis to the best of your ability. I think that's one thing. It was unique because prior to COVID, I'm thinking local church setting. There were many churches that didn't necessarily post every day, but all of a sudden COVID hit, and maybe you noticed this as well. There were many pastors who felt the need to put out content every single day. Why? They weren't doing that whenever we were having church in the building on Sunday and Wednesday, but there was something different about not having that tag in every single week where pastors begin to think, no, discipleship needs to go from Sunday to every day. It needs to be an everyday situation where we are helping people engage with the word of God. So utilizing social media to put out those daily devotionals, obviously phone calls and text messages, you can't underestimate the uh, the power of picking up the phone, getting on the phone with somebody and giving an encouraging word, um, starting a text thread or a group me thread or a remind thread where you're sending out daily content, daily devotionals, asking for prayer requests and uh, creating that culture of engagement around the word of God. Uh, another thing that we, and Matt, I really want you to talk through this one, uh, a unique opportunity that we have that some of you probably have capitalized on before is typically every campus has a learning management software. For my campus, it was Blackboard. Uh, I know there's a variety of those that are out there right now. Many of you probably use Blackboard. Matt, talk to us real quick about how we can capitalize through Blackboard on using it even as an evangelism tool. Right, right. So something that you can do with Blackboard is you can email an entire class. Um, and I, I think that with boldness, 
Um, it, it does take some boldness, but um, utilizing your faith and boldness and just sending an email to your whole class like, hey, um, we have a campus ministry. We're still going. We're still thriving. Um, we still believe in God. We still have faith. If you would like to be a part of it, you know, you can invite them to the Zoom meeting or um, you can let them know that, hey, we're even having a small in-person meeting. Uh, we'll be following the guidelines. Um, we'll have masks. We'll have social distancing or whatever. Um, so you can utilize that. Uh, you can utilize. Um, there are ways to still invite people on campus. Um, and I, I, know, I don't know if you wanted me to get there yet, but. Uh, OK, something that just popped in my mind was the woman with the issue of blood, how she would do. She did whatever she needed to do just to touch the hem of the garment of Jesus. And there are still students that have that same hunger and that same desire. They will do whatever it takes, you know, understand that like we're, we're preparing for um, the post COVID and we should. Um, but there are still going to be those students on campus that want that face to face interaction and they want that face to face conversation. So also preparing yourself, you know, bring a mask and just invite the bring your C card, invite someone out like, hey, we're still a campus ministry. We're still thriving. We're still anointed and we would love for you to join us. So that's another way that I would utilize. Yeah, I'd say just a point of advice on Blackboard. I think you can email all the students without emailing the professor. Um, <laughs> well, I say it doesn't go both ways. If you're going to get real bold, include the professor in there and just let him stop you. Um, <laughs> but I know that their goal is not that the learning management software necessarily be used in this way. The other option is to email people as individuals. So instead of set, sending it as a as a full class blast, maybe you just send one at a time, copy and paste that email in, say I want to introduce myself. Also, typically classes have discussion posts at the very beginning of class saying introduce yourself. Always take that opportunity to throw in the fact that, hey, my name is such and such. I lead a campus ministry here on the university. If you ever want to know more about the Bible or set up a Bible study, I'd let, throw that in any chance that you get, whether that's in person, over a Zoom call, or even in that, that discussion board setting. Uh, just trying to let people know who you are as quickly as possible. Mike, do you want to want to jump in here? Talk about some ways that we can still reach people, evangelize, whether it's using technology or just ways to approach this during COVID. So one thing I'd recommend, I'm actually, I did this with the youth, um, but I think it also applies uh, very much so to campus ministry. I think one thing that we kind of get caught up in that we, we, we can miss an opportunity in the sense that we get so focused on our own social media platform of our campus ministry. But what we've seen to be extremely successful is getting the actual students to post their testimony on their own page, like especially the new converts. Uh, we did this a lot with our P7ers um, where we would, a newer convert, we'd have them get on their own Instagram and post their video about their story and how God saved them. And there was a ton of traction that came through because when you look at it, a lot of people, especially when they first come into church, uh, there's such an opportunity to connect to all these all these people they're connected to that maybe haven't heard their story yet. And so I think from a campus standpoint, we have a very um, an, an amazing opportunity for some of our students that are already connected to people or some of our saved students are new converts that come in that are already connected to all these people that are in fraternities. They're connected to them through uh, through um, sports, uh, through uh, the gym, through whatever old classes. And so if we were to have them get on and share their story or to talk about a specific topic, it would really, really do some amazing things. And we've seen it happen where it's it sparked Bible studies, it sparked questions. Um, so I think we need to utilize social media in every aspect, not just from our own personal page of our campus ministry, but also their personal pages of the, the students, because every single student has their own world of influence uh, that we need to reach. And even if they were to post, they're not comfortable, but they take the leader's post and post it on their own Instagram, it's going to get a lot of a lot of traction. And uh, one thing I learned, I can't remember where I heard this, I think it might have been a podcast, but I heard, or a YouTube thing, but I heard that when you repost something on Facebook, you actually uh, lose a lot of volume. But when you post it by the first, you post it directly through Facebook rather than reposting through YouTube, like sharing through YouTube, but you actually post it directly to Facebook, it actually gets boosted a whole lot more and it reaches more people. I don't completely understand the analytics and, and why it does that, but that's just the way it works. 
uh, there's more people that will come across your post if you solely post it just on that one platform. So there's things we can do to get the word out to more people. And I think we got to get strategic. We got to get creative and we got to think with the mind of how can I reach as many people as possible? And everybody's connected to a lot of people on their own personal pages. So try to reach people through that. That's a great way to do it. Man, what you're saying is so, so true. I, uh, the other night I was thinking now is, is now more than ever, we need to capitalize on the connections that we've been making over the last few semesters. Reality yeah. is we don't know how many new people we'll be able to connect with, but in sales, there's this referral method that if I'm going to go and I'm going to sell you something at the end of that conversation, I'm going to say, now, now give me five other names of somebody who would be interested in hearing what I'm talking about. I wow. wonder, could we leverage though that same thing where we're talking about these individual Bible studies? What if we let that new convert kind of take the lead and say, hey, I know we've been talking each week, but I want, I want you to build a Bible study. I want you to, to invite whoever you want to be part of this. This isn't gonna be with the whole group. We're not talking about going and, and meeting with 70 other people. This is just you and your friends, and I'm happy to come and teach. I want you to be a part of teaching, share your story, share your testimony. But leveraging those new converts, those disciples that are in process, it's not too early for them to get involved in evangelism themselves. But now more than ever, leveraging those people that we've been consistently building connections with over the last, uh, last little while. I think what you hit on there is so, so important. Matt, quickly share. You shared a testimony the other night through the the e-blast, what we just talked about with Blackboard and all this about Taylor at U of L and a something incredible she saw uh, using the e-blast. Can you share that real quick? Sorry about that. My internet slightly went out. Can you react? Okay. You're good. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So a second ago we were talking about utilizing the e-blast functionality, whether it's through Blackboard or connecting. But you shared a testimony the other night about Taylor. They're at U of L. Share that real quick, just to let people know what happened. So um, we have twins, one Taylor, one is Sydney. And Taylor, what she would do was email the entire class. Um, she would utilize every opportunity that she could. And I say every opportunity, I mean every opportunity. Um, if she were, if she was going to go to the bathroom, there was going to be a C card left in the bathroom. Um, but there are two things. So she would invite people from class via Blackboard. And this was still when you could invite in person or we were still in person rather. Um, so she would see them in class. Maybe they were doing a group project and she would email them directly. Hey, I'm also a camp, you know, part of the campus ministry. Um, and we've seen several students come in that way from her doing that. And also she was working at a dorm and um, I believe five to six students this semester just from one dorm, um, from her utilizing that. But yeah, from from Blackboard, just utilizing the emails, the group work that you you know we're going to be involved in group work this semester. So that would be a perfect opportunity to email your group mates and say, hey, you know, look, I know that we're working on a marketing assignment or whatever, but Jesus is still real. <laughs> would you like to meet him? So and that's what she would do. She would reach out. She would be the bold one in class. And she would reach out and be like, hey, I know that I said this in class. This is what I was meaning. And this is what the scripture says that goes along with it. And there are a lot of students that were receptive to that. You would see them that come up and be like, wow, your testimony just, you know, it touched me. Thank you for your boldness. Thank you for your uniqueness. Thank you for allowing God to utilize you. Um, so there were several testimonies in that, you know, in those regards. Those students didn't necessarily come to our meetings, but a seed was still planted. And it was just simply because she was bold enough um, to send those messages to, you know, she would send them to the teachers. <laughs> she was having conversations with teachers about the salvation experience and about why we believe what we believe. You know, she just has a great boldness to her. I, I love it. Absolutely love it. I would say to those of you who are watching, one thing that I understand about this generation is there are so many gifted, talented people in our generation. And, uh, and especially those who are diving into, you know, creative ministries, ministries that wouldn't have even been around or thought of 20 years ago, whether that's utilizing video or that's graphic design. And now more than ever, we need those people with those giftings to step up to the plate. I would, I would encourage you to get creative. Don't let it just be your local church who's having to get creative with how to use video. I mean, most of us have 
some kind of some kind of smartphone that has a decent camera on it. Uh, put your best foot forward, whether it's those daily devotions or it is pre filming a Bible study that you're going to premiere on your social media. Learn the technology that's available at your hand and figure out how you can leverage it in order to be effective in in campus ministry. Um, want, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, absolutely. Just really, really quick. Uh, just a thought provoking idea. So one thing we've done on the campus when we were in person that was extremely effective and really got people's attention was putting very, uh, I guess I, I guess I could say debatable um, thoughts, debatable doctrinal, um, whatever. We'd put out like, for instance, is Trinity really in the Bible? And it would really get people's attention. It'd be an attention getter. Um, it'd make them think and they'd be like, well, of course it's in the Bible. So I'm thinking through what Matt's saying and thinking through what you're saying, Caleb, and I think a great way we could get people's attention, maybe not blasting it to everybody with a specific, uh, which I guess in some people's eyes would be controversial, controversial, but a way to put these types of questions out there that's going to get people really thinking and going, you know what, what is he talking about? Of course, that's in the Bible, but putting these questions out, you know, is there really three? Uh, I guess you could do it on Blackboard, but I'm just thinking of ways that we could really get people's attention and it will it will create a conversation if there's any type of hunger in there, putting out those questions, um, you know, is evolution really true? Um, is there really, is the Trinity, exi the Trinity is not in the Bible. Uh, what does the Bible really say about this? Just some ideas of things that they can throw out there to really get people's attention. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would also not underestimate the ability of getting connected to other social media groups that are within that ecosystem of your campus so your campus groups your um just whatever facebook groups that you can find really a lot of what we're in right now is this idea of lead creation we're just trying to throw wide nets to get people in while we're still trying to build relationships uh, i think it's this give and take of both of this being in a digital setting it's harder to build those strategic relationships but it's easier probably to throw wide nets digitally to try and see, hey, there might be somebody interested out there that we never would have been able to connect with if we were just doing evangelism by passing out cards on campus because our paths would have never have crossed. But through technology, through social media and some of these platforms, maybe we have the ability to do some of that. I wanna quickly transition. As of right now, I don't see any questions that have come through in the chat. If there are none, that's perfectly fine. Put up one more poll and, uh, this one's really just for my sake. On a scale of one to 10, how tired are you of having to wear masks or of having wearing masks? So apparently I don't know how to type. I've been out of college too long. Uh, select one of the following, nine, 10, or 11. So again, this one's just, <laughs> just for my sake. 45% of you have voted. We'll give it just a second more. Uh, uh, there we go, 67. We'll close it in five, four, three, two, one sharing the results there we go 63 percent are at an 11 i agree with you 100 percent. i am sick and tired of having to wear the mask this too will pass we just don't know how soon it will pass I, uh as we kind of start moving this towards a close i do want to talk about let's say we are on campus when we're back in this this setting one thing i know is that life may not go back to normal especially immediately we don't know how long this is going to last I didn't expect COVID to be hanging on this long. Uh, I was in a setting yesterday, and I'll talk more about this whenever we close this out, but Missouri District Conference, Brother Gleason was speaking, and uh, he referenced a man in his church that works in the prophetic. And uh, he said he came up to him a couple Sundays ago, and he said, what I really feel is that there's going to be three or four pandemics. Now, Brother Gleason took that to mean three or four waves of coronavirus. We're in another second wave now. And uh, his personal belief was that we could have one to two more waves of, of this virus. If that's the case, we really don't know when we're going to be out of, of COVID. And even when we are out of COVID, how does life look different? And whether that's wearing masks or social distancing, all of this. Um, whoever wants to jump in here, talk very quickly. We don't have to spend a ton of time here because I know we've hit some of these things. What are some practical steps we can take whenever we go back to having in-person services, in-person evangelism and outreach? to still abide by those social distancing guidelines, but not lose our effectiveness in ministry. Not everybody at once. I think I'll, I'll go. Um, I think one of the things that you can do to kind of maybe lighten the mood a little bit is, you know, uh, 
pass out hand sanitizer. I mean, everybody's <laughs> trying to get their hands on it. Um, and even if you can possibly get your church to get behind you, maybe even get people to donate hand sanitizer uh, for meetings or even donate masks um, as a way to let people know, hey, we're going to meet, but we're going to we're going to we're going to take these precautions into consideration. You know, if you don't have a mask, you know, we'll provide one for you. Um, just as a way to let people know, like, hey, we're thinking of what's going on, but we also want to make sure you feel comfortable uh, being a part of this. Um, and I, I know that people they'll 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 appreciate that. Um, I know that we hate wearing the mask. I, I hate like today I had to run to the store real quick and I I hate and I almost forgot my mask and I was like I hate having to say man I need my mask when I leave, when I leave the house but um, it's just one of those things where you know it's subconsciously with people and even in a college setting you're going to get people some people don't want to wear the mask some people do but just to err on the side of caution. I would just go in the mindset of that everybody's going to want to wear a mask regardless and just say, Hey, I'm trying to do my part to, you know, I'm thinking of what's going on, but at the same time, I want to do my best to reach out to people and, and, and just go the extra mile and let people know you're thinking about them because as Christians, that, that's what people are expecting us to do. They're expecting us to uh, be thinking of others. And so that's just something that I would, I keep in the back of my mind. Um, that's, that's for me. So hope that makes sense. No, I think I think what you're saying is spot on. Reality is we live, especially those we're working with on the college campus, they are a socially conscious generation. They are culturally conscious and aware of what's going on and very responsive to what's going on. And so in many ways, if we just threw caution to the wind and said, forget it, we think coronavirus is fake, and we just went out there on this tirade saying, it doesn't matter. We probably destroy our witness in the eyes of many of the ones that we're trying to reach. And so no matter what your personal beliefs may be on this, it might be prudent and might be wise to err on the side of caution and show that you are at least being proactive about taking the proper steps whenever you meet in person, if that's masks, if it's hand sanitizer, if it's social distancing, um, being proactive and just doing the best that you can uh, in the eyes of those students to take those precautionary measures. Again, I hope that we're through this at some point in time in the near future, but we just don't know. We just don't know how long it's going to be. I uh, wanna move towards closing this out. And I, I shared this just uh, kind of middle of this call that with every crisis, there are always opportunities, opportunities that may not have presented themselves before. I referenced being at Missouri District Conference this week, Brother Gleason was speaking and he, he had a lot of great things to say, but he began to talk about the value of pressure. And he used the life of Paul. I think Mike already referenced some of this, but he used the life of Paul and how Paul, it was pressure that brought out revelation in Paul's life. But then he made this statement. He said, you know, I hear a lot of young preachers, and I'll be honest, I've been guilty of this, that have kind of put the modern day church up against the Book of Acts church and said that basically we have dwarfed the, the Book of Acts church. We have seen every miracle they saw. We've seen the 3000s and the 5000s get the Holy Ghost. We're rewriting the whole story. Um, they're just basically saying that anything that they accomplish, we've done more. And obviously this is the greatest days of the church. And I agree that this is the greatest days of the church. He said that there's four statements in the book of Acts that until these four statements can be used to describe us, then the Acts will always be our foundation. It will be our benchmark. The first statement he referenced was in Acts chapter five after the apostles have been preaching in the synagogue. They're arrested, put into prison. Angel comes and lets them out. They go and, and the people who are in charge go crazy. But they make this statement in Acts 5, 28, when they say that these are they that have filled Jerusalem with their doctrine. Can we say that we have filled our campuses with our doctrine, that we have filled our cities with our doctrine? In Acts chapter 8, the, the scripture says that everyone went everywhere teaching and preaching the word. Its significance here was it wasn't just the preachers or the apostles, but every saint was a preacher. Every disciple was making disciples. Can we say that every member of our campus ministry is turned around and actively involved in making disciples on our campus? In Acts 17 said, these are they which have turned the world upside down. And finally, the statement in Acts chapter 19 that he referenced was Acts 19.10. This one's directly tied to campus ministry. In my mind, where it says that all they heard all they which were in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. An entire, at that time, country, region heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Until those four statements can be said about us, can we really say that we have mirrored or matched the book of Acts? But this is what he said. 
He said, if you look at the context of each of those statements that were presented about the church in every single one of those, those seasons, there was immense pressure that was being put on the church. It was not easy. It wasn't in times of peace. It was in times of persecution. It was in times of turmoil and unrest. Yet it was through that pressure that it began to push out the greatest days of the church, the greatest miracles, the greatest outpouring. It came in these seasons of pressure. And even as I'm speaking right now, I feel confirmation of the Holy Ghost that yes, we're in a season of immense pressure, that yes, we don't know what the political climate is going to be. No, we don't know when coronavirus is going to break. No, we don't know when we're gonna be back in normal. It, the pressure is on us right now, but I am believing that through this pressure, it is going to push us into greater seasons of revival. It's going to force us out of our comfort zone where the church, we're forced to leave the building. There's no other option at this point in time. We've gotta get creative to continue to fulfill the mission that God has placed on our lives and God has placed in our hearts that burden. So don't run from the pressure. In fact, yes, let's pray that, that there will be peace and let's pray that there'll be coronavirus, but really let's lean into the season that we're in and say, God, whatever you wanna accomplish through this, if it's a purifying process, if it's an elevating process, if it's stretching us for greater seasons of revival and growth, we're right where we're supposed to be. The church just needs to step up to the plate and respond in the same manner that the Book of Acts Church did. Let that pressure propel us forward. I wanna kick it to these, these other guys as we close this out and, uh, and really just kind of throw this last question to you and talk, talk to me and talk to those who are on this call about what are some of the greatest opportunities you see? Yes, we know the threat of Corona. Yes, the threat of racism that's attacking our country right now, the threat of the political climate of our country. We're back in just a, a man, tense season of political unrest, social unrest, civil unrest. But what are some incredible opportunities you see for the church, but specifically for our campus ministers in this season uh, that we're living in today? Whoever wants to take it first, feel free. Go ahead, Matt. Well, uh something that god was kind of giving me is we're, we're coming in at equal playing field and we've always been at equal playing field but students will begin to see that more now than ever before when we go on the campus now we won't see these big gatherings so what that lets me know is that the students that are on campus are free game so usually we would be fighting against the fraternities the sororities um, the other campus ministries that are already larger and they've been established for many years um, that you know, students follow a crowd. So those Bible studies, like maybe like crew or other ones, sojourn, whatever else, they may have had 200, 300 already committed to their Bible studies and incoming freshmen would follow the crowd. So it'd be a little easier for them to gain um, students to come to their Bible studies. But now there's a restriction on meeting. So there's no longer a large gathering. And I don't even know about fraternities and sororities, how they would even meet. So what, let, what that lets me know is, like Brother Mike was saying earlier, we were praying against those spirits and those longstanding spirits. Well, God completely took those away and opened the door for us to have access to these students. You know, students who would go to campus for to, to join the sorority or to join the fraternity um, or to join a particular Bible study group. Now, those are shut down or those are extremely limited. We now have the opportunity to witness and to reach each one of those students now more than ever before because of this pandemic that we are in. So good, so good. Brother Jason, why don't you kind of give us some closing thoughts? What are the greatest opportunities you see during this, this season? I kind of the piggyback off what uh, Brother Wilson was saying was that we, yes, we have a unique opportunity uh, to reach people. Like you said, the playing field's even now, uh, we don't have to fight with the big crowds and things like that. But something that really uh, kind of stuck out to me, because Brother, Brother Saucer, you mentioned about the political unrest and dealing with racism and things like that, is I would tell people to, to not walk around with your head in the sand. You know, be aware of what's going on around you. Um, and, the best, and the best thing that I could tell everyone is to show empathy to people. Um, something that I have experienced uh, and I've seen dealing with other people is that you're going to come into contact with people who have, different, who have a different walk of life than you. But that doesn't mean that, that what they've experienced is not real. That's just something that shaped their worldview. Um, so what we have to do as a church is we have to sometimes show empathy and put ourselves in that person's shoes and sometimes seek to understand more than to be understood. Because I found out when talking to people, um, get, getting people to talk about themselves, it opens, it up, opens them up for you to be able to talk to them about the gospel. And getting to talk about the people love talking about themselves as much as they say I don't like to talk about myself yes we yes they do 
We all love to talk about ourselves. This is what I'm doing. This is what, you know, getting them to talk about themselves. And that segues into you being able to share with them the gospel because you took time to listen to what they're going through, the hurts and the pains that they're dealing with, and just being there. You know, people are hurting and people will respond to love and they will respond to someone who truly has taken the time to listen to what they have to say and see where they're coming from. And I promise you, if you do that, you'll have people, more people coming to you to hear what you have to say, because they know that you're somebody who will take the time to listen. You'll empathize with them, but not only will you empathize with them, but you'll take the time to show them, to show them Jesus and show them how he can take their hurts and pains and turn those things around for their good. Jason, I don't have anything to add to that, man. That was very well said. Very well said. Now more than ever, we need to be the hands and feet of Jesus, show love and empathy and mercy. I love it. Mike, bring us home. Go ahead. And... Yeah, this is just a very quick thought, and I think it's very relevant to what we're dealing with here. I heard a man of God say one time that the way you open up somebody's spirit is either through laughter, through worship, or through tragedy. And I think right now, with all the tragedy that's happening, is sp people's spirits are open more than ever. Um, and that is, you know, not everybody's a worshiper. So that is one of the ways that every type of person, no matter what walk of life, atheist, Muslim, uh, Buddhist, whatever, um, they're seeing everything going on and their spirit is probably more open now than ever before because God, all this stuff's happening. It's driving people out of their comfort zone, which gets them to a place of feeling out of control and being a little bit more open than normal. So we must take advantage of this opportunity through everything happening and not, uh, put ourselves in a shell and just hope that it ends. Obviously we hope it ends, we want it to end, but there's an opportunity in that while we're struggling, while we're going through it, like you said about Paul, which I thought was amazing uh, what you said. So just something to think about, their spirits are open right now. Yeah, where sin doth abound, grace doth much more abound. Now more than ever, the church can shine bright, our campus ministries should shine bright, and we should, through a demonstration of the love, yes, we talk a lot about demonstration, we want a demonstration of the Holy Ghost. We want an outpouring of miracles and signs and wonders. But honestly, right now, we need a demonstration of the love of God, yeah. of the grace of God, of the peace of God, that everywhere that we are, we're living examples and testaments of what God has done in us and what he wants to do through us. Guys, thank you so much for your time tonight. I, I feel like we we dove right at the end of this conversation into a whole nother conversation I would love to have. And so we might need to look at doing a part two of this webinar where we we dive a little bit more into this conversation about racial tension and political tension and some of this and how we respond as campus ministers. But thank you for your time. To those who are listening, I apologize. Something did happen with the chat feature. I've gotten a couple of texts from a couple of people that that are saying they weren't able to find it or weren't able to to see it. So I apologize if you had a question and weren't able to share it. Um, that is that is on us and we will make sure that the next time we do one of these that we have that working appropriately. If there is a specific question that you have, feel free to DM us, reach out to us through social media or through our uh, email info at campusministryonline.com. You can connect with us there um, or always through our social media. We're happy to, to answer any questions that you may have. But in the meantime, now is the perfect time to be strategizing going back to campus. I encourage you to check out campusministryonline.com. Look at the resources that are available to you. Uh, the Ministry Central Training Course is a great tool. The Strategy Guide is a great tool. The Bible studies that are available there. A few other resources I'd mentioned for teaching. There's a site called discipleshipcentral.com that is really designed for small groups and for daily discipleship. It's video-based content that could be used in your campus ministry. Um, some teaching material, Link 247, is another great resource that could be used in your campus ministry. Um, there, there's many resources and tools out there that you can leverage in order to have effective cultures of discipleship in your campus ministry. But thank you for what you're doing. Uh, all hope is not lost. But in fact, I think through these cri this crisis of COVID, but also it's just setting us up for the greatest opportunity we've had to be what God has called us to be in this hour. So we appreciate you. We love you. You are our heroes. If we could do anything to serve you, we are here to do that for you. To the guys who joined us, thank you for your time and for sharing your hearts tonight. We appreciate your insight. We, uh, we will look to do some more of these conversations in the future. And if ever we can serve you in any capacity, please let us know. God bless you. And let's go in the name of Jesus and have revival on our campuses.